I'd like to call this public hearing to order. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscom? Here. Mr. Joyce? Mrs. Evans? Here. Notice is hereby given that Scranton City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, September 19th, 2013 at 5.30 p.m. in Council Chambers, second floor municipal building, 340 North Washington Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. The purpose of said public hearing is to hear testimony and discuss the following. File of Council number 47 of 2013, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the consolidated submission for community planning and development programs to be funded under the Community Development Block Grant or CDBG program, Home Investment Partnership or Home Program, and Emergency Solutions Grant, ESG program for the period beginning January 1st, 2014. And before we begin, thank you. I would like to acknowledge and thank Ms. Abley, OECD Director, Attorney Michael O'Brien, representing OECD, and Mr. Tom Priambo, also representing OECD, for their attendance at this public hearing. Our first speaker is Lee Morgan. No? Tricia Thomas. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Tricia Thomas. I'm the executive director of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Northeastern Pennsylvania. And first of all, I would like to extend a thank you to City Council, Mayor Chris Doherty, and the Office of Economic and Community Development for your past support of our programs, our building, and your belief in our organization. The Boys and Girls Clubs of Northeastern Pennsylvania has two CDBG applications before you, one for our parkit program and one for the renovation of the first floor interior of our building. We respectfully request that City Council fully fund both applications. The Parkit Program. The cost of the Parkit Program is $63,000. We currently have a funding request pending for $11,000. We need $52,000 additional dollars to successfully run this program in the summer of 2014. Parkit is a free 10-week summer program, essentially the entire summer, that keeps youth safe, supervised, fed, and off the streets when school is not in session. In 2013, we served 254 children at three sites in the city of Scranton. Since 2003, in the city of Scranton, the Parkit program has helped to provide safe and suitable living environments, helped to improve areas that serve low to moderate income youth, and helped to improve low to moderate income neighborhoods. There is a great need for localized summer programs such as Parkit when school is not in session, especially in low to moderate income neighborhoods. Parkit helps to prevent summer learning loss, addresses the need of a lack of transportation to and from summer programming, addresses the lack of nutrition during the summer months, and addresses the need for affordable summer programming. If we do not receive the entire funding, we will have to decrease the number of locations, conduct the program fewer days, conduct the program for fewer hours per day, and or serve less children. A main goal of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Northeastern Pennsylvania is to never turn a child away. With your help, we will not have to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julian Kalsinski. Uh, hello, my name is Julianne Kalasinski and I am the Development Director at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Northeastern Pennsylvania. I am here today to speak in regards to the club's application to renovate our first floor interior. On behalf of our board of directors, our staff, and the 1,000 children we serve yearly, I am respectfully requesting to please fund this project in its entirety. The project will cost approximately $180,000 
all of which has been requested from OECD. If you can imagine, with about 200 children in our building, day after day, our first floor is interior is in dire need of renovation. Our building was constructed in 1973, and this portion of our building has never been renovated. We have cracked floors, we have old paint on the walls, and we have some lights that don't even work. We do try to band-aid the building when we can, but now is the time for a complete renovation of the first floor interior of our building. Our building is kept clean and safe, but we want our members to be proud of their facility. The project will take about three months to complete, and it will not disrupt any of our services currently being provided. Our programs, and our programs are staff-driven and building-based. We need funding to keep our building safe and up-to-date. Two of our biggest expenses are, first is the maintenance of our building. Second is staff expenses. We need to pay our staff to implement these much needed programs. Therefore, we need both applications to be fully funded by OECD. So please keep in mind why the Parkit program and the first floor interior renovation project are so essential, not only to our organization, but also the city of Scranton and the children we serve in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Michael McHale. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. My name is Michael McHale. I'm the director of Project Hope at Camp St. Andrew. I am here on behalf of United Neighborhood Centers. As the director of Project Hope, I have been involved with the organization for the past 25 years. Um, we are requesting money to keep this continuing. Project Hope serves underprivileged children from throughout Lackawanna County, but primarily the city of Scranton. Yesterday it was published that one third of the children in Scranton are living in poverty, and these are the children whom we are serving. We are asking for you to fully fund our application for Project Hope. We served over 11,250 meals just in 2013 to children who attend Project Hope. We have a long-standing relationship with the Scranton School District. We have five teachers who come up to Project Hope on a daily basis. They provide extra instruction in science, math, reading, language arts, spelling. We have a nature program. We have um, a lake where the children swim each day. We also have a pool. We have speakers from throughout Lackawanna County that come up and provide drug and alcohol abuse education, um, all different kinds of programs that are important to the community. Project HOPE has been in existence for the past 44 years, and we hope that we can continue to provide the necessary educational and recreational activities for the children from throughout Scranton and Lackawanna County. Thank you very much. And thank, you. thank you. Marianne Iazzi. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Marianne Iezzi. I am the Executive Director of Dress for Success Lackawanna. And I'd just like to thank you um, for your previous support of our agency. And if you're not familiar with what we do, we're an agency that helps women who are transitioning back into the workforce. Um, we're best known for our suiting program, uh, providing professional clothing for women who are transitioning back into the workforce. Um, we also now are providing career development services and workforce development services. And um, the funding that we're asking for is to help fund those programs, our workforce development programs. Um, we're finding now, we have seen uh, just recently this year up till this date, we have an increased number of referrals and many of our referral partners are here tonight for services for our women to be suited. Um, we have surpassed our projected um, goals 
up until this point. But we're not only finding that the suiting program um, is, is, has increased referrals, we're also finding now that our career services are receiving increased referrals. So women, we're finding that women are coming to us not prepared for the workforce. Um, so what we're doing now is uh, we're not only providing them with the professional resumes, the professional cover letters, but we're also providing them with the skills and the tools necessary to not only just go out and find a job, but to land a career. Um, and, and that's what our goal is with these women, is to help them find a career to make them economically self-sufficient. Um, so. Um, you know, those, those factors are really key to empowerment and to building self-confidence and self-worth and self-sufficiency. And our mission at Dress for Success really directly responds to those key factors. Um, those are priorities for us for reaching, educating, and empowering women. And, um, you know, your support will help us continue to provide those services. So I would just um, thank you for your consideration. And uh, on behalf of the women we serve, um, we hope that you would consider uh, giving us the full funding for our request. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Uh, just real brief uh, with this tonight. I do appreciate Ms. Abley and, and the staff from OECD coming in here this evening. Um, and you know, just from you know taking a look at this uh, briefly uh, throughout the week, um, I do believe there are a lot of worthy uh, you know institutions and, and you know programs out there that are worthy of the funding. You know, particularly the uh, the street paving and um, you know a lot of those those different types of things. Uh, you know, blight removal. Uh, the West Lackawanna Avenue Bridge, I believe there was funding uh, that was put in for. Uh, but one that stood out for me that I, that I thought uh, should be definitely one of our top priorities uh, moving into next year, 2014, uh, is the, I believe, 183000 that was applied for by uh, the Pinebrook Neighborhood Association. And I do believe that, you know, that's, that's definitely uh, something that should be a priority. I know that was one of the... Uh, one of the uh, applications that, that wasn't recommended by uh, the Office of Economic and Community Development. However, I do believe that that council should take a close look at that. Um, perhaps we can consider giving them a portion of that funding, maybe not necessarily all of it, if that's um, allowable for us to do. Um, I'm assuming a study was done where they came up with that $183,000 figure. But you know, I just know that each summer we, we consistently have, have come to this podium and, and we've, uh, we've certainly uh, been disappointed in the fact that this is probably maybe the fourth summer now that those kids have suffered over in that part of town. And I, and I do think we need to take some sort of action. And if, if this is the appropriate way to do that, then I think we need to, we need to do that as, as a council and uh, ensure that we can support them in some way. As I said, if it's not possible to give them all of that funding, uh, there has to be something we can do because I don't think we can continue to go on and allow that, that pool to, to continue each summer to be closed. And uh, I, I do think that's something we have to address. But again, there's a lot of worthy projects. That's what makes it difficult to determine where the funding should be allocated. Uh, we have a lot of priorities, a lot of things we have to take a look at. But the Pinebrook Neighborhood Association and that swimming pool particularly jumped out uh, for me uh, just because we've, we've had a lot of discussion about the swimming pools and, and the upkeep and the funding that, that uh, unfortunately isn't there each year to, to you know, obviously have a full complement of swimming pools. But if we could certainly take a look at this and uh, see what we can do to help them out down there. They, they put a lot of hard work in, and, and I do think if uh, we have the opportunity to, uh, to give them some assistance here with funding, I think we should definitely jump on that. That's all I have on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peg Ruddy. Good evening, and thank you. Good evening. I, too, want to express my appreciation to uh, Mrs. Abley and Mr. Preambo and the OECD department, as well as city council and the mayor. Uh, last year, we included an extremely successful project at the Women's Resource Center, uh, where we were able to get a new roof and a new paint job, and um, now we're moving on to um, some other wish list items that are necessary to keep our buildings safe. Again, my name is Peg Ruddy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Resource Center. Um, earlier this week in the newspaper, uh, according to Acting Chief Graziano, unfortunately, violent crime is on the rise in Scranton. 
Um, and while domestic violence is not often separated out from those reports, we know at the Women's Resource Center um, that that's one of the crimes that is on the rise. Women's Resource Center is the sole provider in Scranton and all of Lackawanna County for crime victims as it relates to domestic and sexual abuse. We're the sole provider of emergency housing and crisis intervention service and advocacy for those adults and children. A lot of the funding sources out there now want new projects, special projects. Um, we're here to talk about our need for money for our core service, uh, which is housed in our safe housing program. So Women's Resource Center has two applications in for 2014. One is for to continue our emergency housing for victims of domestic violence in Scranton and all of Lackawanna County, although the majority of our clients are from Scranton. We're requesting $30,000 through the Emergency Solutions Grant so that we can provide prompt 24 hour a day, easy access to a safe place to go for moms and kids who have to flee their home because they're not safe there. We're also asking for an additional $4,500 for our rapid rehousing program. We know oftentimes uh, abusive partners may leave their family in a lurch with a house that they can't afford and they have to move quickly. So in order to keep them out of the shelter or the safe housing program, we'll use those dollars so that they can get independent living in their own apartments. Our second application is to the Community Development Block Grant Program. We're asking for $25,832 so that we can upgrade our security at our building. We also want to be able to replace some sidewalks. I believe that each and every one of us here would agree that we have a fundamental right to be safe in our homes. Fundamental right. That is not true of our fellow Scranton citizens. And so we're the safety net for those individuals. And so I would appreciate your consideration for our applications this year. Thank you. Thank you. Angela, I can't make out the last name, I'm sorry. How is that spelled? Siebert, S-E-I-B-E-R-T. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, uh, I'm Angela Siebert from EOTC. I'm a program coordinator. Um, I'm here to speak about two projects before you tonight. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with EOTC, we're a Scranton-based nonprofit agency with a 25-year history of promoting the economic stability of area residents through workforce development, youth mentoring, and uh, human service programs. Um, with the city's assistance, uh, we recently renovated a property at 431 North 7th Avenue to create a multi-service family resource center. Uh, currently, uh, approximately 3,000 children and adults come to the 7th Avenue Center each month, most of whom are low to moderate income Scranton residents. Uh, we have requested CDBG funds in the amount uh, of $82,460 uh, in order to reconstruct sidewalks and install light posts in front of the 7th Avenue properties. Um, the affected properties would include our building at uh, 431 North 7th Avenue uh, and also the adjacent uh, 413 to 415 property which we recently purchased for future development. Uh, the existing walkways are cracked, uneven, and pose a risk to pedestrians who come into our center, neighboring businesses, and also to the nearby Scranton High School. Uh, the lack of adequate lighting uh, for this North 7th Avenue walkway poses an additional hazard to children and parents who are coming into our center for evening and late afternoon programs. Um, aside from increasing public safety and access to programs that serve low to moderate income residents, the lighted sidewalks will also improve the overall streetscape along the 400 block of North 7th Avenue. Um, the city's consolidated plan also specifically mentions the need to replace sidewalks, so we feel that that's in keeping with you know, some of your goals. Um, our second request before you is to support new workplace literacy uh, projects um, inside the county prison. Um, EOTC has a long history of providing employment and training programs for low to moderate income residents. Um, particularly disadvantaged women. 
Um, with 2014 CDBG funding, EOTC will introduce a program that integrates life skills, employment readiness, basic financial literacy, and job search training for individuals with significant barriers to employment. Uh, recently, the county's Criminal Justice Strategic Planning Committee specifically asked EOTC to develop a workplace literacy course to increase the employability of individuals returning into this community from Lackawanna County Prison. The goal is to reduce the likelihood of taxpayer dependency and homelessness among Scranton residents with criminal backgrounds. Our program will serve low to moderate income residents while they are housed at Lackawanna County Prison and then link them uh, to EOTC's employment services and other community programs upon their release. Um, we believe that both of these projects are tremendously important for the benefit of taxpayers and we urge your support. Uh, and we are also committed to working with the City Council and OECD to further uh, better our city. So, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Steve Wallace. Good evening, Council. My name is Good Steve evening. Wallace. I'm the Vice President of Southside Neighborhood Watch, uh, Southside resident. I'm here tonight to uh, suggest that you hold this figure for the OECD funds for the police department to 309, 404, and 10, because to cut it, we would be losing officers we need. We have currently three officers right now stretched throughout the city. We need five, and that's what this funding is allocated for. They're stretched to the point where when you see them at the end of the day, they definitely want to go home. Imagine riding a bike all the way from the top of Valley View to Moosic Avenue and doing it three or four times a day. Or from, say, Center City up to the top of East Mountain. They're doing this on a regular basis every day, and we only have three of them to cover the entire city. Now, in the paper, they said they want to cut it to 152 from the figure it was. I think it should stay at the figure it is so we can have the additional two officers. I mean, both Westside and, and our group have been using these offices since they came back in in May, and we've had success on drug arrests, on blighted homes, on vandalism by children. And if we lose them or we don't get the two extra officers, it's just going to go back to where it was. So thank everybody, you know, ECD for their funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Abley. Would you care to address that specific topic? Sure. I know that you had provided council with information about the neighborhood police Sorry, patrols. Can explanation. The neighborhood police patrol is a public service. And we can use only 15% of our total allocation of CDBG on public services. And if you look on page four of my sheet, we can, uh, based on $2.4 million, we can only spend $360,000 on public services. <clears throat> so if we did fund the Neighborhood Police Patrol, the $300,000, you would have to cut all the other public services. So that's why um, currently I have 150,000 from 2010 that we're currently using. 2013, we put in 150,000, and that's how I came up with 152,000 for 2014. Currently, um, we have uh, five, three uh, officers on the beat. So that the, the money that your office uh, has suggested in terms of allocations is to continue funding just those three officers. Correct. Because if you if we fund any more, you're going to have to take it off all the other public services. It was not an easy decision to make. You want to fund everyone, but we had tough decisions to make, and that's how we decided to do it. And and the funding that um, was available, as you mentioned from previous years that's now been used we're using we're using I believe 2010 
And then we did not fund the Neighborhood Police Patrol for 2011 and 2012. We started January 2013. Mm -hmm. So currently we have three beat cops on patrol right now. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Andrea Wharton. No, no. Well, if you, um, Mr. Wallace, you could stay and speak with uh, the representatives from OECD following the public hearing. Marie Schumacher. Good evening, Council. Marie Schumacher. Good evening. Good evening. Um, before I get into what I'd done before, did I just hear Ms. Avely say that it's three, not the five, that was published in the paper? Um, Correct. I There's believe the what was published in the paper were the uh, applicants, you know, the applications that were submitted by every agency and organization. But I believe that, um, you know, the actual allocations, they have not been publicized because they have not yet been decided. Oh. So. The, what was published in the paper is just what everybody asked for? Yes. But, but this says only 309. Uh, for the hiring of uh, CD. I, I mean, I can just interrupt you. I can address your question very briefly. The, the authority that ultimately has, uh, uh, the decision-making body that ultimately has the authority over these allocations is City Council. I understand that. You know, with the, with the representatives of, o, of OECD do as the subject matter experts and as the people who are most familiar with these projects and how they're implemented, would they, they give the elected representatives of the people their opinions. So what was posted in the newspaper, as, uh, uh, as Ms. Evans said, were the applicants. What uh, OECD has recommended was not posted because that's not final. The final amount is going to be determined by the, the, the elected officials who, who have the last say on uh, the taxpayer's money. Thank you. Um, I would like to know how many first-time potential recipients are on this list and how many are new? Um, we have one. Um, it's a public service, and it is. Can you read? Hold on. It's the Northeast Suicide Prevention Initiative. Okay. And they've asked for eleven thousand. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I have a real concern that that we're, some of these agencies are getting overly dependent upon OECD funding. Um, and I would think their boards would be out raising money. So I would like to see uh, what percent each of these uh, agencies' budget is being, would be funded by the OECD grants, if that would be possible. I think that's, um, that would be very helpful to know. I, I do think it's incumbent on some of these people to, to do. And I'll get down to United Neighborhood Center in, in again in a minute. Um, I would like to know if there's a list of properties to be demolished that backs up the half a million dollar item requested in the uh, newspaper article. And I would like to know approximately how many are on that list. Um, Ms. Schumacher, Ms. Ms. Ingley, Schumacher, there, we do not have a list right now. Um, we get the list from licensing and permits. The house is demolished, and when they are ready, I mean, I'm sorry, they're um, condemned, and when they are legally ready to be con uh, demolished, those addresses are provided to OECD. Well, if we don't have any statistics on the number, then how, how can we know whether or not a half a million dollars is a reasonable amount? Or how can council do that, and how can we let them know how we feel about that if we don't have any idea what the size of the population is? This, that answer would have to come from licensing and permits. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rogan, since this is I, your department, would you I would just would add, um, 
obviously anyone who walks through any street in Scranton, there are no shortage of homes um, in the city that, that are in need of either rehab or demolition through these programs. This is um, demolition only? It de demolition as well. And there's certainly, um, there's not a lack of properties that need to be demolished. Um, the funds are the, the issue. If we had, we could probably spend $20 million on it in the city. But I'll, I will ask um, um, the proper department for that list. Thank you. Uh, of the previous year's demolition, what percent have uh, of the properties have been disposed of by sale or transferred to a, no a new owner? I would answer that question by uh, saying that you know the allocation of funds that OECD recommends to the council and that council also ultimately has the authority over. Uh, that's where that stops. The uh, the allocation of funds to demolish. That's the purpose of this. Uh, request and that's the purpose of the allocation. Uh, but it, it's it the demolition and disposal of blighted properties throughout the city of Scranton. What then happens to the properties afterward? Obviously, all of us have, but, have an interest in that, but it's not something that we would. So then, it's not for demolition and disposal. It's for demolition only. You're not disposing of the properties. I would again ask Mr. Mr. Rogan to answer that question for me or get the answer to that on of the properties that were demolished last year. Sure. Thank you. Um, and then uh, there's, there's an axiom about you get what you pay for. And on the CDBG grants, um, we're paying for a lot of things that I don't think, while they're necessary, are addressing our basic problem, which is lack of employment that would allow um, if we had some job creation, parents in a lot of these instances would be able to provide for their own children. And I think only $200,000 for economic uh, development activities is sparse compared with the, uh, as a percentage of the total CDBG block grant money. So for what it's worth. And then um, on the UNC, last year's year-end uh, loan portfolio showed 47 uh, payments on a $300,000 loan were late with a notation of a five-year moratorium on payments. Uh, there was nothing, nothing stating when that moratorium took place or if it's ended, but um, you know, giving, giving money to people who are not uh, uh, showing the uh, paying uh, for when they do have a loan, I think, should be a factor in the decision process. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? <coughs> Good evening, council. <coughs> Good evening. I really don't know how I got on the top of that list last time, but it must have been a miracle. Um, you know, sitting here listening, um, I, I agree with a lot of things that Marie Schumacher presented here tonight in regards to demolition. I think that the $500,000 that the city wants to have diverted out of these community development funds for dem demolition should be frozen. Um, there's just too many questions as to what's going on with those demolitions and the city finds itself in court for tearing down properties that were owned by different individuals. Um, and to be honest with you, we're, we're tearing houses down and we can't even maintain the lots that they used to stand on. And uh, to switch off now, you know, I'd like to see the Boys and Girls Clubs receive total funding for what they've asked for. And um, the reason for that, as a child, I played at the Scranton um, Housing Authority, which was an old church that the Boys Club had. And it was a real asset for us in the community, on the hill, and, um, you know, we used to have two boys clubs in the city. We have one now. Um, and I, I just think that they, in my opinion, are probably very seriously overwhelmed with the amount of children they're trying to serve. And I just think if this is community development money, um, I do understand that um, there's a lot of places that we'd like to spend that money. But I think that um, the city and the residents of this city need to have a genuine concern for the children in our community. And I'd have to say that if anybody would possibly meet low to moderate income, 
in my opinion, as a child, I would have to say that the Boys and Girls Clubs definitely met that at every instance, and it was really a great place to be as a child. And there are a lot of other people here tonight that have come dressed for success, and, 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 you know, there's, and the literacy program for the prison. These are all very important to this community, long range. In other words, to turn this city around and to give us something to work with in the future. So I just hope this council would pay a lot of attention, would take the $500,000, set it on the side, and take a good look at that, because maybe that money could be better spent somewhere else. We've done a lot of demolition. What we need is a lot more development. And I agree with Marie. Maybe, maybe 300000 of that should go to help create jobs and to help spur some kind of economic development in this city. And, you know, I just hope you'd consider some of the things I said, but I just think the Boys and Girls Club is a very worthy project. I'd also like to say that I'd like to see Novembrino Pool and the Kapaus Avenue Pool. I'd like to see some funding somehow to get to them to open those city pools because um, not only is that a safety issue, but there are a lot of children in those neighborhoods and if this is community development money, then let's develop the community with it and let's fix our fixed assets, which are the city pools, which benefit low to moderate income children in this city from all the neighborhoods because they will come from everywhere to use those pools. And maybe it's time to really consider that. I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else? I'd like to thank all of you who came before us this evening to present your cases for funding. We're well aware that the federal government has decreased funding to all of these social service agencies. I hope, on the other hand, that you too are aware of the fact that the federal government has been decreasing funding to municipalities specifically CDBG, ESG, home. So our mission, or our goal perhaps is a better term, is to fund as many worthy projects as we possibly can with annually dwindling funds. So please know that all council members will take into consideration what has been said this evening by each and every one of you. And we do have a 30-day waiting period, I believe, in which citizens may submit written comments to the Office of OECD. And when that time period has uh, passed, then the legislation will return to Council's desk in seventh order for final approval. And it will be at that time that the announcements will be, will be made public concerning the final allocations to each of the agencies and organizations. And once again, I thank everyone for your participation. This public hearing is now adjourned. for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who died in the last week, particularly Robert J. Donahue, Sr., beloved husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, uncle, decorated World War II Army veteran, and member of the Scranton Police Department for more than 38 years, Donald R. Sherman, devoted husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, Korean War veteran, and retired patrolman of the Scranton Police Department, 
and their dear families and friends they leave behind. Please also keep in your prayers the mother of Scranton tax collector, Mrs. Courtright, who's recovering in the hospital. Roll call, please. Here. 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 Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order, 3A, minutes of the Scranton Housing Authority meeting held July 1st, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B. Agenda for the non-uniform municipal pension meeting held August 28, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, agenda for the city planning commission meeting held August 28, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, agenda for the zoning hearing board meeting held September 11, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, applications along with decisions rendered by the Zoning Hearing Board on September 11th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3F, subdivision and land development evaluation from the Lackawanna County Planning Commission received August 19th, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3G, tax assessors report hearing dates held August 14th and 21st of 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any clerk's notes tonight, Mrs. Craig? Yes, Mrs. Evans. We received uh, another prompt reply, I should say, from Chief Graziano from Council's requests on September 5th. Thank you. He always promptly uh, responds to our office. He tells us that the stop sign request on Elm Street and Broadway Avenue for pedestrian safety uh, and is a concern at this location due to the Heritage Trail. The initial reaction was to place stop signs at these locations. However, after reviewing the locations, topography, existing traffic patterns, and the amount of pedestrian, pedestrian traffic at these locations, it is our opinion that installing stop signs may be a greater safety danger than not installing them. Based on the above mentioned reviewed factors, it is our opinion that installing mid-block stop signs there would increase rear end collisions and the associated injuries to a greater degree than if they are not installed at all. Officers monitored vehicle to pedestrian traffic ratios for several hours at these locations over a three-day period and reported observing approximately 25 pedestrians and several bicyclists attempting to cross the roadway during the times officers were there. While the pedestrians they observed generally had to stop and wait for traffic to pass, one violation of yielding to pedestrians in crosswalk was observed and traffic citation was issued for that violation. Additional signage has been installed there regarding pedestrian crossings and additional enforcement efforts in these areas will be needed to address this issue in the safest and most effective way. The second part of his response regards the trucks in Bellevue. There are eight officers in the department certified and that have access to the required equipment needed to weigh vehicles for truck enforcement purposes. These officers' primary duties are patrol functions and are assigned based on shift manning to truck enforcement details several times a year. The most recent detail is occurring today. He refers to 9-18-13. Acting Captain Glenn Thomas oversees these details and has informed me that five truck enforcement details have occurred in the city since January of 2013. While officers conduct these details in various parts of the city, they were instructed to spend part of their time on each de detail in the Bell Bellevue area. 
I've been informed that during these details, trucks have been stopped in Bell Bellevue and inspected, but no violations were discovered on these said trucks nor on other vehicles during the times they were there. Of the trucks they observed and detained, they were either found to be under the weight limit or were making a local delivery, which is an exception to the ordinance. The officers are certainly not stating that no violations are ever occurring there, only that during the five times this year that these officers were conducting the details, there were no confirmed truck ordinance and or inspection violations. Citations from these five enforcement details were issued in other parts of the city. Additional truck enforcement details, manning permitting, will be conducted and this area will certainly continue to be part of the overall enforcement concerns and directed enforcement efforts. Number three, traffic violations on East Mountain Road. Patrol supervisors and officers assigned to that patrol sector have been directed to monitor this location more frequently for violators. And that's it. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Craig. Thank you. And uh, we thank the chief for his immediate response to our citizens' requests. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Just one. Last summer, uh, Michael and Nic Nicholas Gautry decided they wanted to raise money for the Hope for Hannah rescue mission. Um, they announced they were going to sell lemonade and iced tea for 50 cents a cup. Once word about this fundraiser got out, um, the entire neighborhood and community came together for a very large fundraiser. Um, this year, they are continuing um, this great work by having the second annual Hope for Hannah fundraiser. It's this Sunday from 12 to 5 p.m. at 356 North Everett Avenue in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, just like last year, there still will be um, lemonade and iced tea. Um, there will also be hundreds of baskets that have been donated, um, entertainment, food, and there will also be animals there available for adoption. So this is definitely a worthwhile cause and I look forward to attending myself and I'd like to invite the rest of the city. It'll be a, a great time. That's all, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else? Solicitor Hughes is unable to attend tonight's council meeting. In addition, Councilman Joyce isn't feeling well and cannot attend the meeting. Ms. Linda Abley, OECD Director, has informed Council's office that the public caucus with representatives of the Steamtown Mall Associates is canceled for September 26, 2013 and will be rescheduled within the next several weeks. St. Anne's Maronite Catholic Church, located at 1320 Price Street in West Scranton, will hold its annual festival this Sunday, September 22nd, from 12 noon to 7 p.m. Homemade Lebanese foods and pastries will be featured, as well as picnic favorites. Additionally, there will be basket auctions, raffles, children's games, a white elephant sale, and much more. Bring your family and friends to this enjoyable event. And finally, we're very glad to hear that Mr. Newcomb Sr. is recuperating at home at this time. And um, I do hope that he isn't driving his poor wife crazy. Hmm. And that's it. Fourth order, citizens' participation. Our first speaker tonight is Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Good evening. Um, over the, the August recess, I, uh, knowing that uh, when we came back we were going to uh, be getting into budget season, I thought I would take some time to uh, brainstorm some possible revenue enhancements uh, for the city moving into next year. And uh, I could say recently I've, I've taken the time to explore some innovative ways for the city to generate much needed revenue during our times of uh, serious financial distress. Uh, during my hours of research, I did review many revenue generators used by cities uh, struggling uh, fi financially across the Commonwealth. One particular uh, revenue enhancement that struck me was a 2009 proposal by Pittsburgh Mayor Luke Ravenstahl to adopt a 1% tuition tax on post-secondary education. 
The purpose was to enact a 1% tax on college tuition costs in an attempt to make college students pay their fair share for city services such as roads, police protection, and fire protection. I became more curious about this uh, proposal and had a few questions of my own, such as the legality of the ordinance, how the fees would be collected, just to name a few. I spoke with Pittsburgh's deputy city clerk, Mary Beth DeHaney, who recalled that this revenue generator was expected to generate approximately $16 million that was sorely needed for a city that was facing pension shortfalls and an inability to pay its bills, all problems that we also here at Scranton uh, share with Pittsburgh. She graciously provided me with a copy of the ordinance that I do have with me this evening, and I can supply it with uh, the council's office later on. At the conclusion of my conversation with the deputy uh, city clerk, I then had a conversation with the city's law department to ensure that such an ordinance was legal in Pittsburgh. After speaking with the assistant city solicitor, I was informed that the law department spent ample time on this issue and ultimately found it legal to pass in Pittsburgh, which is a class two city. The city of Pittsburgh spent weeks back in 2009 debating this proposal. However, the city council saw a change in power in 2010 and the ordinance died. Using the information I was provided, I took the time to put a spreadsheet together with the city of Scranton's higher educational institutions. I researched average tuition costs as well as approximate enrollments. I then factored in the 1% tax, which resulted in an estimated revenue projection of about $6.5 million annually for the city of Scranton. Without getting too far ahead, there's certainly many questions that we have to ask ourselves here at home. And the most important question tonight is, would it be legal for Scranton as a class 2A city to pass such a fee? And if it does happen to be legal, I would suggest that we seriously consider this proposal or this ordinance and consider including it in our 2014 operating budget. For years, we've discussed paying your fair share, and I firmly believe that it's time that everyone, including college students, contribute towards the services that the city provides daily. We face tremendous financial challenges today, and so it's going to take ideas, vision, and creativity to overcome them. And I truly believe that this plan can be a start. And uh, I would like to uh, pose that question to you, Mrs. Evans, if perhaps we can have Attorney Hughes, I know he's not here this evening, look into the legality here in Scranton. It is legal in Pittsburgh, two-way city. Um, is this something here in Scranton that we can look into and, and pass? I think uh, certainly we can ask our solicitor to take a look at the information that you've gathered and to uh, research it further. And uh, I'd also suggest that our finance chair for council uh, would become involved in that research as well. Uh, certainly, if such a thing were legal for the city of Scranton, we could not expect to realize the dollar amount proposed in Pittsburgh, obviously. Of course. But it would be important for uh, the finance chair to perhaps uh, seek assistance in developing um, a projection for the city of Scranton. So I'll certainly talk to both of them. I appreciate that. And um, just to relay the message from the officials in Pittsburgh, they were very cooperative and and providing information, answering questions. I, I spent probably 40 minutes on the phone with the deputy clerk and probably about a half hour with the uh, assistant city clerk, and they were very helpful, informative uh, with the questions that I had and, and willing to provide me information. And, and they did relate to me that um, if this is something that the city would like to look into, um, that their doors are open, um, you know, they're a phone call away, and they're, they're willing to cooperate with whether it's you know, Mr. Joyce, the finance chair, or attorney Hughes, anybody on council that has questions. Uh, you know, they said feel free to contact them and they could share. Uh, you know, any information that you do need. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Les Spindler. Good evening, the Council. Les Spindler, city resident, homeowner, taxpayer. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Tuesday, Bill Courtright was at the German apartments taking questions from the residents there. I was also there. The one issue a lot of them brought up was the they park in the Electric City garage. A lot of the cars are being vandalized. There's no security there. And uh, they asked, Mr. Courtright said that the city doesn't own the garages anymore. 
So, and they, they did get in touch with Mr. Washoe. Mm -hmm. Mr. Washoe said there's nothing he can do. For someone who makes $100 an hour, that's unacceptable. He should hire security, put cameras in, or do something. These people shouldn't have to park there and have their cars vandalized. These are low-income people who live there. They can't afford to go somewhere else and park. Or fix their, they can't even get their cars fixed now. They were really upset about that. So I think Mr. Washoe should uh, do something about that, so maybe council could send him a letter asking him to try to help these people out. Uh, another issue they brought, the, the uh, building manager brought up, false alarms. They used to get charged $250 after three false alarms. Now she said that, I don't know if it was this council or a previous council, that they raised it to from $250 to $1,000 only after one false alarm. And she, uh, she showed Bill Courtright the notice that they got. It's $1,000 after one false alarm. So I, I think that's, everybody said that's ridiculous. I'll check that, but I don't believe that's correct after it's, one she, false I, alarm. Bill, Bill saw the, the, the notice. They, they got a notice about it. So I'll get saw it. I didn't see it, but he did. She, sure. The building manager showed it to Bill. I don't know if it was this council or previous council. That, that's how it was changed in the 2013 budget. It was um, included by the administration in order to increase revenue. Uh, however, now I could be wrong, but it was my understanding that there's there's no fine after the first false alarm. Well, that, that the building manager said that's how it was. So I, that's I'm just going by what she said. There is. Each time. Thank you. Well, that's the notice that Bill saw. Uh, okay, moving on from that. I notified council earlier this year, and I had it in writing, about uh, parking meters in front of residences on the 700 block of Madison Avenue. And uh, those meters are still there. So I don't know if anything was done about that. No, nobody got, there was no letter sent or anything? Yes, a letter was sent. Yeah. But the meter's still there. I don't think people that live there should have, have parking meters in front of their, their residences. Uh, lastly, Yesterday's paper is a story about a possible liquor tax. And uh, some people, that, 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 of course, the establishments were against that. I don't think it's that bad of an idea. Because people that are going out drinking, they're going to drink no matter how much tax, how much they pay. And uh, if it does cut down on some people going to the bars, maybe we'll have less drunk drivers on the road killing people. So I don't think it's that bad of an idea. That's all I have tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gerard Hetman. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Gerard Hetman from Lackawanna County's Community Relations Department. Uh, to begin this evening, I would like to share some details on two upcoming community events that are currently being planned by the Community Relations Department. Our first event actually takes place tomorrow afternoon, and that will be the second annual Lackawanna County Senior Health and Wellness Fair. Uh, the health fair takes place tomorrow, Friday, September 20th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at PNC Field on Montage Mountain Road in Music. The health fair will be held on the upper suite level concourse. So when visitors come to the stadium, they'll just go up to the front of the building, and they'll see the double doors, glass doors on the right side of the facade, the first baseline for us baseball fans and they can go in there and there's an elevator uh, if people can't use the stairway to make it up to the suite level for the event. In addition to free flu shots for everyone over 65 years of age, we'll have over 50 health and wellness vendors there um, offering a variety of services. This will include free health screenings, blood pressure, hearing and vision checks, as well as a variety of giveaways, uh, health and wellness items, refreshments, and I'm sure most of them will have tchotchkes as we say in general. Um, the, the event is free and open to the public, and we encourage everyone who deals with senior health 
to come out and uh, enjoy a good afternoon. We did this last year for the first time. It was a great success. We look for hopefully good turnout for this as well. Our second event, and this is kind of my baby when it comes to planning, is our annual public safety fair, which we refer to as Heroes Day. Heroes Day this year takes place on Saturday, October 5th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Lackawanna County's 911 Center on Valley View Drive in Jessup. In addition to guided tours of the 911 Center and facility, we'll have a range of vehicles and equipment relating to fire departments, police departments, and emergency medical providers present at the location. Uh, so all of us, the children, and the children at heart that are present can get in the vehicles, handle the equipment with supervision, and get a real first-hand look at what our public safety professionals and volunteers do on a daily basis in our communities. Uh, we'll also have some historic emergency vehicles on hand for the first time this year. We'll have vendors that relate to public safety, community agencies that provide those services, and we'll also have refreshments. And again, the day is free and open to the public. Uh, we gear this towards children, uh, but as I said, it's for kids and the kids at heart and all of us. And I'm sure Mr. Laskin can agree who among, who among us would like to see the fire engines up close, right? So everyone's invited. Um, please feel free to let your friends and neighbors know about both events. And secondly, and this is always a big hit with the municipal governing bodies in your offices, the latest edition of Lackawanna County Lines is now in publication. And as many of you, I'm sure, are familiar, County Lines is a publication that lists statistical and other information relating to government offices and services that serve Lackawanna County's population. All of the federal and state agencies that provide services to county residents are listed, and each municipal government and school board also has its own page with all of the listings of elected officials, uh, office staff, as well as contact information. And of course, that does include the city of Scranton's municipal government. Uh, so we will, we will leave a print copy with Mrs. Craig for council's office. And anyone that wishes to access the information can visit the Lackawanna County homepage, www.lackawannacounty.org. And there's a big banner in the middle that you can click on and download a PDF copy of county lines right to your computer or personal device so everyone can access the publication for free. And it's very handy to deal with for anyone that has to uh, contact municipal government for any services. So we'll leave that with Mrs. Craig at the conclusion of the meeting. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's all we have. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Um, the first thing I have here tonight is, um, you know, I, I did listen to what Mr. Miller said about, you know, trying to raise income from college students, and um, I, I'm hopeful that council and the mayor and the administration <clears throat> wouldn't even consider that. And there's a reason for that. A lot of children, uh, the uh, young adults that go to college borrow an awful lot of money to go there. I mean, I have a son that's a college student. I don't think we should be taxing students. I think that uh, it sends the wrong message. I think that um, a lot of students are struggling to go to college, borrowing money, getting grants. Uh, just because the University of Scranton and you know institutions of higher learning won't come forward and pay their share that we feel they should at least contribute to us. I think it's, it's, it's in my opinion, wrong to go to somebody that has no defense and who's borrowing the money to try to enrich their lives and become better citizens and tax them for the mistakes of, of the administration, whether it's this administration, whether it's Harrisburg, whether it's Washington, wherever that is. I mean, I just think it's time for the adults to pay the bills they've generated. And I think it's time for the people in the neighborhoods who thought that voting was a joke to step forward and start paying. I mean, it may come, you know, we're sitting here, we're waiting to see if there's going to be uh, any borrowing as far as paying the debt the city has to its city unions. And I just don't see the city being able to borrow any money. The city's just completely broke. And, you know, to listen to these candidates talk about a commuter tax again, to be honest with you, I think that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania should come here and pay off our debts. They sent the PEL here to come and rescue us. And what happened is the direct opposite, because we're in more trouble now than we ever were. And when you sat through the hearings for the two or three days when they were there at the courthouse, 
The PEL didn't present any kind of evidence to prove to me that they had the best interest of this city in their mind. And when you look at this Commonwealth, across this whole Commonwealth, I mean, Doug talked about Pittsburgh, but there's tons of communities that the PEL hasn't helped. So, I mean, if, if it's not possible for these communities to come out, out from underneath this debt, and if we don't have representatives in Harrisburg that are willing to create legislation to help us with our debt, then what are we doing? We're going back into our neighborhoods, and we're, for lack of a per better terminology, creating the Detroit of Scranton, because we can tear down all our homes, we can leverage taxes on everybody until everybody leaves, and then all that will be left in the city are low and maybe some moderate income Scrantonians. But our population base is completely inundated with overtaxation, and our population base is dwindling. The people that are basically here are seniors. And not even, not even their children want to come back here. So we've got to make a very, very stark change in direction. And I think that to keep coming up with ways to raise revenue when we can never turn the corner is absolutely ridiculous. Because we keep going back to the same people for more and more money. They have no more money to give. And we keep just destroying our neighborhoods, destroying our communities, with overtaxation, lack of opportunity, because the lack of opportunity is because businesses won't come here. They don't have to. They have capital. They can develop anywhere. We have, to, we have to get our state legislators and our state senators out there to go to Harrisburg and mix it up with the governor and tell him that our back's against the wall. And to be quite literally honest, it's much more than that. We're, we, went, we went all the way through the wall. There's just nothing left. And you know, look, at Mr. Joyce takes a lot of hits for, you know, tax increases and some of the things he's done. But these are some of the things the PEL said were the solution. And he stepped up, the council stepped up, and even the mayor stepped up, and we agreed. And where has it taken us? I'm, a, I'm surprised the city isn't completely out of money by now, to be quite honest with you, because that budget was just so short. And the PEL knew it, and the court knew it, but you know what? They put it off for another year. And if we keep putting it off, walk through the neighborhoods, and there's more for sale signs than ever before, and I know I say that quite often, but it, they just seem to be growing. And, and we keep talking about demolition, and I don't know, just where are we going here in the end? Where is Scranton going? I mean, when I was a child and I played here, we had 101 or between 101 and 103,000 people. And you walk through this city now as a 54-year-old man, and I wonder, Where's the Scranton that used to be here? And I just watch more and more of it disappear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just, you know, sure. one thing, point of clarification. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the, the tuition tax in Pittsburgh is not paid by the individual student. It's paid by the institution, if I'm not mistaken. And, just, um, I know, as was mentioned, um, it fell by the wayside, but it did seem to open a door to talks with uh, their local colleges and universities right. because their pilot contributions increased significantly thereafter. Mr. Dobson? Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Dave Dobson, resident of Scranton. Uh, no return on my uh, taxes, my federal income taxes from all my property and so forth. I don't fit the bill. <laughs> um, okay, now a few weeks ago I mentioned we need to modify the word politics. Put an E after the T, and separate the ticks from it. You would need an extra T and you would spell polite ticks. Stop making uh, wild accusations and harassing people about one vote and it's uh, whether you agreed with it or not I wasn't any help either way I would stay neutral on it but uh, uh, be careful uh, be a little pragmatic because what you get by not being pragmatic uh, might be something you really don't want when somebody packs it in and says I'm tired of sailing into the wind. Um, if, once again, if there's anything that could be done, look into Mulberry Street parking. 
by the university. Personally, I think the parking spaces should have gone with the project. Uh, we narrowed Mulberry Street and now we're putting parking spaces in. And we tried to put parking meters in and they got taken away. And it's just ridiculous. It's, it's like you're driving drunk down that street. It's a very busy street and it's very dangerous. Now, on the books I brought last week, I'd like to advise the public that knowledge is power. Don't be somebody's fool. Uh, David K. Johnston, C.A.Y. Johnston, is an excellent author and an investigator. He's also an attorney, economist at a college, and he has it together as far as all of the improprieties that are going on. And on taxes, everybody's trying to invent new taxes. And last week I disclosed that uh, 2,700 companies around the country, uh, including Chinese and foreign banks, are deducting their income tax for the state income tax and being allowed to keep it in their pocket. So why the hell do we need all these new taxes when they're giving away the old taxes? That's what happened. We gave it away. We gave everything away. We're allowing these people to keep it as a KOZ or some baloney. Money that they deduct out of their employees' checks and then we're talking about new taxes. We don't need any new taxes. Just start, stop giving away the taxes we got and then uh, decide from there. And uh, we heard a little bit about literacy and I might mention that they uh, withdrew the plan in the county jail to uh, provide literacy training and now we're funding it from Scranton which I am absolutely not against but I think that a high school diploma would be excellent if a probation officer would oversee it or a parole officer and maybe we could get some retired teachers in there as tutors and give them a tax break for their time you know, let them, let them live tax-free. I don't care. But if, they, if they'll spend 10 hours a week or something like that, or 8 hours a week, say, uh, training people that uh, have been in the prison system, then, you know, uh, people just don't think out of the box. It, it's, it's ridiculous. And uh, East Mountain, now we have that Scranton Lake issue, and you've been hearing it every week about how somebody's a great benefactor and so forth. Well, his property adjoins the end of Wheeler Avenue, and you could go in there, and if he really needs, there's a Mill Street bridge, which looks kind of decrepit right now, at the end of Mill Street. It's the end of the old Erie barns, uh, railroad barns. Why can't he build a bridge? Build a bridge to his other property and stay out of our upper upper level neighborhoods. I wouldn't want all those trucks in my neighborhood either. And I, I don't live in a high class or a low class neighborhood. Uh, it's time to use your money to truly benefit the public instead of expand your name and have little brass plates all over the city. Uh, and uh, once again with Congress we're up for another round of trade packs. They get a bock, bock, bock for that. What we, that's just what we need, more unemployment. Uh, the cooch uh, from uh, the Attorney General who's running for governor from Virginia, I figured out what his uh, married life laws and so forth are. And they go like this, go home, shut your mouth, and worry. We don't have a way to arrest the usual suspects because if you pay attention to our business, we'll be hearing you'll be hearing from us. And uh, finally, uh, I'll make this quick. Food stamps are on the chopping block. In, uh, and uh, 40, something like 75% of the people on food stamps have been in the military. Uh, a, a good portion of them are single mothers and they're working two jobs and so forth. You know, we're so pro-life in this country. Everybody loves the fetus, but they hate the baby. Thank you, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget the bok, bok, bok. Is there anyone else who cares to address council?
and East Regular Citizen Scranton Fellows, Scantonians. I read in the paper 108 loans came up again. Are we still paying Boscos 108 loans from the, from the mall? Mm -hmm. When I asked the lawyer that, he said no. But yet we are, and I know we are. And I know you brought it up when they came before us for the first, another loan, when you guaranteed the loan. That was, what was it, a year ago or something like that? It was 200 some thousand, I think the paper said. I can believe it, because we've been going over and over and over with that 108 loan. It, it's been in the action plan every year I've been on council. Um, and I believe, I may be wrong, but I do remember voting on legislation um, I don't know if it was refining, I believe it was refinancing of the loan to reduce the interest rate. This is going back a few years ago. Um, but, but it is included. Yeah, we're still paying it. That's the bottom line. And I thought I heard the, our lawyer once said that they split off the uh, Scranton Drive and Samters from the mall. I hope they didn't. I hope I heard wrong. But the, if they did, that's, them are all warning signs. Because them properties are making money. Whether the mall is or not, I have no idea. But I assume since Bosco sold off the leases, at least he ain't there with the leases. But he does own the building. The mall associates, I guess they call. And the, of course the Hilton came up again. My great point on that. I remember talking when Mr. DeBilio was sitting there in the presidency. I said, let them go bankrupt. And he said, they want to go bankrupt. I said, let them go. Someone else is going to come in. So they went to the county and put out for a loan. The county went down, got them the loan arranged. They went bankrupt anyway. And we subordinated our loan and the money went. That's why we're paying it because we subordinated our loan, which we should never have done. Them are little things. Of course, they ain't the biggest Scranton problems. Our biggest problem, I guess, is what the paper said. We, if nothing goes, changes, we're gonna have over 100% tax increase. That is the important part. I hope we can avoid some of it. But we can't avoid 70% of it. Because they said it was a structural deficit. Over 15 million structural deficit. The other ones are variables. I mean, you can't help when the cost of uh, Medicare goes up for the employees, or I should say Medicare cost up, goes up for medicine for the employees or med medical care. That's a variable. You can't do much about it. But structural deficits should not be. Every budget that you pass should be balanced. And they should be able to be balanced. And there should never be a structural deficit. At one time, it was only five and a half million. And we used to close it with our leasing back, buyback leases, remember? How we used to sell this, buy it back, sell that, buy it back. But that hasn't solved the problem. So far, it has grown to 15 million, the paper says. And I can probably believe them. That's a figure I probably can believe. That's one thing you're going to have to really do something with the structural deficit. Everything else, uh, you can't do much about it. They're going to come. Uh, people get raises, they come up. You can't do nothing about what the mayor did with the firemen and policemen. We're stuck with that. Now that's going to, of course, add to future structural deficits, but it's not quite there, but I don't think we borrowed the money yet. This is what's going to happen. Of course, I saw this four years ago. I told you this was going to happen. The writing was on the wall. You didn't need God to come here and write it. It was on the wall. This was going to happen. I told the people a long time ago, many times when I was at... Uh, different benefits. They come up to me and they said how beautiful Neog was. I said, true, it is beautiful. No qualms about it. But I said, that has to be maintained. When you put anything in the city, it has to be maintained. That costs money. I believe they have to do something with the bridge, coded or something like that. 
I don't know if that's in the budget or not, but somewhere along the ridge, that nice wooden bridge they built that crosses the creek, that has to be taken care of. You can't just leave it sit there and rot. And this is what's wrong in the city. They leave everything sit and rot. And only goes for something, election time, to go out. They used to, anyway, used to go out and pave some roads. That was a great election gimmick. We're going to pave a lot of roads in Scranton. Unfortunately, they didn't pave them very well because they all potholed anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, Good evening. Uh, hi, Marie Schumacher, city resident and taxpayer. Uh, probably a little disjointed because I had a lot for Mr. Uh, Joyce tonight, and in his absence, I'll try to skip over them. But um, 5B, who is the grant recipient uh, of that? It does not designate in there who it is, so maybe during motions you could tell us. And then on 5C, um, I mean, I have, I have no problem with going after grants. I think it's a healthy thing, but I wonder, within the last several years, we spent $220,000 on surveillance cameras that I don't know that if they've ever been monitored. And I don't have any confidence that, you know, throwing $146,000 is still a lot of money, and it could maybe better be used someplace else if it's going to go down the same rabbit hole that the $220,000 went a couple of years ago. So I, I think that's wor that's, that one's worthy of a caucus or something. Um, and then is there anybody who can tell me how property demolitions are prioritized? And Mr. Rogan, you indicated we have so many. Uh, maybe during motions you could tell me how they're uh, prioritized for demolition. Um, and I would like to know if vendors at events such as the Latino Festival and La Festa pay the mercantile tax. Um, I, do, I did walk around the square and uh, and took the names of as many as I could that were from outside of the city. And I'm sure the, the committee would probably share them as well, but I would like a couple of those checked. I mean, the locals, that's part of their business, and I'm sure they're paying. Mm -hmm. uh, and can you tell me if the city's property tax collection company is free to negotiate reduced or forgive payments? The delinquent tax collector, are they? Whatever they are, are yeah, the ones who are downstairs, yeah. Northeast Revenue Service. Yeah, that's it. Are they able to accept payments uh, or to draw up a payment plan? Yes, I believe so. But for the total amount, or the, can they actually negotiate a lower amount or forgive uh, an amount? That I don't know. I, I don't know that they'd be able to forgive anything. Could we inquire? Because I, I understand that could be an issue. And I would like, like a firm. Sure. Okay. Sure. Mrs. Thank Craig, you. can we send a letter um, asking those questions, please? It, yeah. I'll send them in tomorrow. Um, again, now, I had a whole bunch of questions on the parking meters because they are a disaster in the city. Some say Monday through Saturday, some day, some say Monday through Friday. They've got different times. Some don't have times at all. Uh, but now I see in the newspaper that the, uh, the new meters will be uh, installed downtown. So I would like to know, I know that's a separate expense item, um, how much those new meters are going to cost us and what the payment plan is, how is it going to, what is the total amount, how many years is it going to be spread over, um, are we going to pay, have more payments in 2013 or? Uh, I believe that the payments are going to be spread over um, the life of the contract with Republic Parking. But I don't know the monthly amount or the total. So, Mrs. Craig, if we could or if, if contact uh, the representative of Republic to ascertain those answers. Um, and, and in addition, I'm confused on... Uh, many months ago, file of counsel 100 of 2009 was tabled and has never been brought back from the table. 
And I'm wondering now if council has ceded its authority to uh, another entity on setting the days and the times and locations of the parking meters themselves? No. Um, I believe that Republic Parking is following the ordinance that was in place in the city of Scranton that has not been changed because as you said the legislation was tabled because council wanted um, wanted the management to go out to bid mm -hmm. and uh, so at this time I believe that Republic and the city we're adhering to that original ordinance okay um, is it going to be come back from the table or are the, where the parking meters are now or and I guess I may as well hop over to something I had at the end but um, I wanted to just note that a while back I was assigned the task of reporting to council on the spaces where the parking heads were removed at, specifically at the corner of uh, Penn and Linden and I'm happy to report there there are two no parking signs at Linden and Penn and and very few parkers since those signs went up sadly quite the opposite is true on Mulberry Street not only are they parking I mean the meter heads were removed quickly but there are no no parking signs not only are people parking in the parking the rectangles that are painted in those spaces but they're parking behind and in front as well and tonight there were even two in front which reduces visibility and in the 600 wait a minute Maybe the following. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else? 5A motions. Councilman McGough, do you have any motions or comments tonight? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, just a brief comment on the um, CDBG funding and um, what was presented to us. Um, First of all, one of the things that I would like to see done under that is under the home funding, there are a number of projects that are listed. What I would like to see is an additional amount of money being spent on owner-occupied homes, the re rehabilitation of owner-occupied homes, um, rather than giving the money to acquire, rehab, and then resell a home, um, I, I think it would be much better for community development, which is what we're looking at, if people who qualified, economically qualified, were allowed uh, a certain amount of money to make improvements to their home. Um, we're, we're raising taxes and things, and people, I know, uh, I find it difficult to you know, do the things that are necessary for the upkeep of my home. Um, I think these programs, the rehab programs, are much better suited to community development that owner-occupied homes. So someone can put that new roof on and help save their property. Somebody can have their house rewired so that it's not a fire hazard. Um, I think these are things that really allow communities to maintain their stability and to um, homes don't go into decay where they're in need of demolition so as we go through this I would like to see us uh, perhaps increase some of the amounts in those programs uh, under the the home part of the funding and secondly when it comes to the the CDBG grants 
I, I think one of the things that we, we look at and we've tried to look at in the you know, past few years is try to prioritize the needs. Um, all of these are worthy projects and as Mrs. Evans said before, it, it's very difficult to um, make decisions on some of these. But I think what we need to look at are which ones actually provide community development. Which ones are those that are going to enhance the overall community or the small community that you know is represented by the application? Um, but with the decrease in funds from the federal government, it's going to be very difficult, and I, I'm sure that a lot of worthy projects are going to be um, left out or at least the amounts uh, diminished greatly and, and that's a sad thing but uh, hopefully we can use these funds um, you know we, we can project um, things that will benefit the overall community of the city of Scranton um, just uh, very quickly uh, in Mr. Joyce's absence uh, the, just some things from the Pell meeting um, as far as the finances that were discussed at the uh, the meeting it it was uh, we were told that there is there was a, as of Monday six million six point one seven million dollars in cash available with a accounts payable of a hundred and ninety two thousand we the city had made a bond payment to for SPA in the amount of about six hundred and fifty four thousand dollars which you know did diminish the cash available um, amount also it was reported that the the audit the, that the city is up to date the city itself is up to date on what it needs for the audit what they're waiting on is the Scranton Parking Authority and Central Parking that they are the ones that are kind of delaying the process. Um, getting information from them has become somewhat difficult, I'm told. Uh, and there is specific information that the auditors were looking for that wasn't being made available, um, hopefully. Well, perhaps, um, well, you were there, so I don't know. <laughs> Have they tried to contact Mr. Washoe to to obtain the information? Yes, <laughs> and it's uh, it's still becoming it's still difficult to to get some of the information. I believe it was for the um, no. revenues for the specific garages. I think is what they were looking for, or the the budgets, revenue and expenditures for each of the specific garages, which. Um, they were not having success receiving. Mrs. Craig, did you want to? S um, I believe we brought up the fact that they should contact Mr. Washoe, and then the business administrator said she would call him right after the meeting. Now, I haven't heard what became of that. Right. So we're hope hopeful that she did indeed uh, contact the receiver who has direct control over central parking I believe that's what the PEL said yes mm -hmm. and certainly has all of that information I exactly yeah. and hopefully it would you know be provided so that I I if nothing else a preliminary audit could be prepared mm -hmm. so that it can be used for the preparation of um, the 2014 budget and also for you know going for commuter tax for borrowing and all the other things that mm -hmm. we need that audit and people are asking for uh, the other thing that was mentioned 2000 I think was the 2014 RFPs for the 2014 TANS were being issued this week and then one question was brought up by uh, Mr. Cross um, dealing with the Act 133 amendments, which were part of the revised recovery plan, and whether council and the city had taken any action on those. And 
to be very honest, I wasn't quite sure what the Act 133 amendments were, so I did go looking, and um, I'm sure it's something we can discuss and I'll, you know, pr also present to, I, I think they presented to the administration as well. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman, do you have comments <laughs> or motions tonight? Yes, I do. Thank you. Councilman Rogan. Um, first, uh, just a few comments regarding the CDBG loans. Um, and I think the other members of council and um, staff from OECD summed this up pretty well um, also. And funds for these programs are very limited. But when council makes a decision, we need to look at what programs are going to benefit the most people in the city. Um, the public service allocation is very small. Obviously, funding police patrols in our neighborhood is a top priority. Um, poli police patrols, having the beat, police walk the beat, ride the bike, you can't beat that in the neighborhood. They get to know who should be here, who shouldn't be here, and it really does um, provide that public service to the neighborhood to create safer and, um, and nicer neighborhoods to live in. Regarding the general um, programs, um, one of the larger ones in that list is paving. Um, paving has increased every year um, under this council. It's something that we take a, a, when we look at the streets, we get the requests every week. The, the vast majority of them are about streets because the streets in the city are deplorable. Um, I'm sure everyone on council would agree that that's another item that, that needs to be um, funded as much as we can. So when council looks to put these amendments together, we have to weigh, do we want more social programs or do we want more funding going into the city, which would be paving, police, um, demolition. Um, on the demolition, um, I will try to get those answers for you, Ms. Schumacher, that you requested. Um, I have been very frustrated with licensing and inspections on that issue. I know myself, Mr. Joyce, and State Representative Flynn have been working trying to get a home demolished in Tripps Park for many months. And unfortunately, and especially since the election's been over, Mr. Seitzinger has been unresponsive to all parties. And that home is causing a problem in the neighborhood, and it, it needs to be demolished. Um, as far as how they prioritize them, I know after a fire or, or something when it's in imminent danger of collapse, um, they do get torn down very quickly. Um, but buildings that are, are lingering and many times vagrants will be in them. There's another property on North Hyde Park where there are two vacant properties uh, right by one another with vagrants coming in and, and again the same thing, no, no response from, from that office on those. So there's certainly not a lack of properties that need to be torn down. Um, but we do, prioritization does need to, to go based on need, not based on who's requesting it or what neighborhood in the city it's in. So that's definitely something that hopefully under the new administration we'll, we'll see that will be a lot more transparent on how the homes to be uh, put on the list are selected. Next, I would like to make a couple comments regarding a letter that was received um, to City Council from OECD requesting increased funding for administration paving and contingency. Um, the increase in contingency is very, very small, $211.03. Um, in administration, it's $75,000. And in paving, $147,000. Um, if my colleagues would agree, uh, Ms. Craig, Mrs. Craig, could we please send a letter to Ms. Abley um, requesting an itemized list of the administration, um, the overages, and what, if anything, can be done in the budgetary process to correct that for future years. One of the, the things that's frustrating when it comes to allocating the CDBG funds is a, is a large portion of it goes to the folks who administer the programs. Mm -hmm. And obviously we need those folks, but we would like that to be at the bare minimum, that way we have more funds for paving, more funds for demolition of blight, police patrols, things of that nature. So that's something that, you know, we have to watch every cent. Um, these dollars are tax dollars just as much as the dollars in the city budget. These are your federal tax dollars, and 
you know, when we deal with the budget in, in a couple months, there'll be your city tax dollars, your city property and wage taxes. So this certainly is something that, that council can't take lightly. It's not free money by any means. Um, they are your tax dollars and, and we'll do our best to make sure that we allocate them um, the way they can help the most people. Finally, just a couple comments on the article that was in the paper regarding Act 47 reforms and a possible um, drink tax in the city. And I'll reiterate a little bit of what I said in the paper and elaborate as well. There is no question that Act 47 in the state of Pennsylvania has been a disaster for Scranton. Um, we see today, just breaking now in the Scranton Times, that um, motions are going to be filed to seize at, possibly seize assets of the cities to pay the court award of $21 million. That's where Act 47 under Mayor Doherty and uh, DCED, Governor Rendell, that, that's where this brought us to this point, where the, the city um, um, owes out this amount of money. And it's money that's due to the workers. We, we can't question that. They, they are due that money. And unfortunately, Mayor Doherty gambled along with DCED, and they lost. And now the city is coming up with a $21 million hole just for this one item, which is, it's all back wages. It's not... Not one cent of what we spend on that court award is going to benefit anyone in the city currently. That's money that was due many years ago. Regarding reforms, one of the items that was brought up was the possibility of a 10% tax on drinks in the city of Scranton, alcoholic drinks. Um, following that article, uh, my phone, and I'm sure many of us have gotten many calls from bar and restaurant owners within the city of Scranton, and I've even spoken to a few advocates who were um, against drunk driving. And the concern that both groups had was that people, instead of eating or drinking at the bar down the corner or the restaurant in the city of Scranton, that they would travel to the outsir outskirts of the city, Dunmore, Taylor, Old Forge, to eat and drink. And when that happens, there are many negative effects. The first one, and, and actually the, the prime one would be People drinking outside the city are going to find a way back home. Unfortunately, many of them choose to drink and drive. Secondly, the businesses located within the city of Scranton will lose revenue because of those patrons choosing to go somewhere else. And with that revenue lost, um, jobs will be cut from those businesses if they're lucky to stay afloat. Or if they're not able to stay afloat, they may board up. Um, you could drive through any neighborhood in the city and you see corner bars, small family-owned establishments. Um, the downtown bars are, are a little bit different, but I'm looking out for the small neighborhood establishments. And from speaking to them, they, they are afraid that this will cripple them. Um, some re remembered when the smoking ban was brought up in the city of Scranton specifically. Now statewide, I think it's a great thing. It works great. Um, having it statewide, but it, when it was specifically in the city of Scranton, I remember a bar in Manuka, well, right over the line in Muzik, had a big sign up, smoking aloud, come, come drink here, and people did. Um, the bar and restaurant owners in the city of Scranton hurt because it was specifically to the city. And Scranton isn't large enough like a city like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh where people aren't going to travel. From any point in the city in five minutes, you could be in, in another town. So that's something I, I, I really am concerned about on that. And also one of the things that I, I really believe will help the city is the passage of Senate Bill 76, which would eliminate property taxes to fund school districts. And if anyone looks at their property bill in the city of Scranton, the school district is by far the largest portion. The city always gets all the negative publicity, even though the school district is, is the vast majority of your bill. Um, and especially in a city like Scranton where there are so many senior citizens, if they had children or if you know, their children are, are still alive in the area, they were educated 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago and they're still paying these taxes. By going to a sales tax, you have the lower income folks who are only buying necessities such as food, clothing, uh, medicine, and those items are already tax exempt. So with that statewide sales tax, you're not being taxed on any of your necessities. So the lower to middle class isn't going to be paying 
the same way as somebody would if they were going buying an iPad or a boat or, or something of that nature. And by establishing that, that gives the city um, availability to increase the property taxes slightly um, on our end, and you'll still be paying less at the end of the day. And that's a tool that really needs to, to be embraced at the state level. I know State Rep Marty Flynn is supporting it. Um, I know Senator Blake, unfortunately, is opposing it. And I hope that Senator Blake will, will open his eyes and consider um, Senate Bill 76, and it really will help a city like Scranton, where we have so many senior citizens and homeowners who it's the property tax bill at the end of the year that really is difficult for them to pay. So I will hold the rest of my comments for agenda items, and that's all for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one quick item I wanted to to add to um, some of the comments that you made regarding OECD. Um, throughout the last four years, uh, Mrs. Craig in particular and myself have spoken with uh, HUD officials in the Philadelphia office regarding various issues, one of which was administrative costs. And uh, at the time, we were told that um, the 20 percent is the ceiling yep. and that it's not essential for a municipality to designate the full 20 percent yep. however they advise strongly against um, going beneath 16 percent so there is I believe in past years, and I may be wrong, I think 18.5 right. was the level that we funded. We decreased it from the 20%. Yeah. I think the office, and you could attest to that, continued to operate yeah. very well. Absolutely. And um, I, I agree with what you're saying regarding those costs, that they have to be closely examined. And perhaps if, you know, there are going to be additions made within that office, that might be a decision for the next mayor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and, you. And um, Councilman Loscom, do you have any comments or motions? Yes, thank you. Just briefly. Uh, first of all, I, uh, during announcements, I forgot to make an announcement earlier, so if you would allow me at this time. Uh, this is from Ozzie Quinn. The Taxpayers Association will meet on this coming Tuesday, September 24th, at 6.30 p.m. at City Council Chambers. The candidates for tax collector, Frank Joyce and William Fox, have been invited to attend and address questions. Please plan to attend. The next couple of months are important to all of those who own property in the county. Ozzie Quinn. Thank you. Um, and just briefly, I would have to agree with, with my colleagues who spoke prior to me on some different issues on the uh, OECD funding, uh, paving, as Mr. Rogan said, is, is, is always a big thing. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, we, we approved the paving, but I don't know if we actually approved the final list. It doesn't, they already make their list and right. then it's done. Yeah, I would like to have a little bit more say on that aspect. Me too. Yeah, even, in the, even in the city uh, paving also. Unfortunately, um, the DPW director, along with OECD, sets the list in council who Here's for more residents than, mm -hmm. than any of them we get left out of the process. Correct. So, I mean, po if there was some possibility that we could at least have some, I don't know if it's possible, to or have some may, final say in it. Or, you may find that occurring under a new administration. That's true. Yes, definitely. So hopefully uh, there's a little bit more open communication as far as that goes. Um, and Mr. Uh, McGough. He had mentioned about the uh, rehabs for, for homeowners and stuff like that. And that's something we had years ago, I, I, I could remember. I mean, we have a first-time home buyer's plan, but we did have a, a homeowner's rehab plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something whose time is overdue, especially with the economic conditions now. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, who would run that, how that would be set up is, is another thing. But I think it could be done, if not now, hopefully under a new administration that, that uh, you know considers those folks but uh, I believe we have we have our homework cut out for us with the funding that's available we all have good ideas um, I too was looking at the uh, you know I've worked uh, mr. Rogan uh, we've been to, to pretty many meetings at Pinebrook 
and uh, you know they've been without their swimming complex for several years and when, when I had found out that uh, Pinebrook, Novembrino, and uh, Connell swimming complex, they all fall in OECD areas. This is something through the years that they could have used some OECD funding to keep them up to date. But they haven't. They've neglected them. The, the fact is right now, and, and, and I believe it was in the capital budget, that they're, they have in the capital budget to demolish all these bathhouse complexes and stuff at each of those swimming pools. If I'm not mistaken, I don't have it in front of me, but that's in their capital budget. First of all, those buildings, they're not 100 years old. I think they were built a lot in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, in that, in that range. They're structurally sound. The problem is, you know, maybe they need new fixtures, need some work, stuff like that. But I think the main problem of all of them is the roof structures. They're all built with flat roofs, and we all know what kind of problems flat roofs have. There's nothing to prevent them from putting a new roof on those buildings, a gable roof. Look at the Kaiser Valley Community Center. Now there was a flat roof building that had nothing but problems. Look how beautiful it looks with the new roof system on it and stuff. That's something that I, could be, I think could be accomplished economically. And the rest of the work in those complexes, I think, could be done and donated by the neighbors, by local businesses and stuff like that. But I do think a major problem for those areas would be the roof systems. And uh, I, would, I would lean towards, you know, in my mind, I like to see a project each year. You know, uh, Penn Ridge has been closed the longest. Mm -hmm. Penn Ridge for next year. The following year, maybe Novembrino and then Connell. Something like that. Just update the, uh, the roof system, get the neighborhood associations and local businesses to chip in and get them. I mean, you know, we need a place for kids to go. In West Side, they've been developing things. They have the uh, skate park. They have, now they're looking at a youth center. And I think the swimming complex would, would fall in beautiful with all that because it's all in a triangle there. Uh, for West Side, and I believe the neighborhood associations in South Side and uh, Pine Brook have been working hard for their neighborhoods, and I think the children in those areas, which are probably some of the lower income areas, who don't have their own access to swimming pools, should be the beneficiaries of some of this. That's what this OECD money is supposed to be for. So I would like to see somehow that uh, that project remain in there, and and again. We have a, a small pool of money we have to work with, and uh, you know, hopefully we can we can accommodate everybody to some degree. And uh, the the other thing that disappoints me is the police situation. And a few years back, it was four years back, we had 13 OECD officers, and. I'm not going to go through the whole history of how it happened, but we ended up with none. It appears to me that through the last two years of communications, there was a pot of money aside, we were going to be able to build it back up and all that. Now I find out the police chief only applied for five, which he was told was the max he could apply for at this time, but they're only looking at offering three. This doesn't satisfy me. I don't know if it satisfies my colleagues, but we have to find a way to, uh, to man these police officers. All we have to do is look at the TV every night. Look what's happening in Wilkes-Barre. Look what's happening in Williamsport and Hazleton. We don't want that element here. You don't see a lot of it in the newspaper, but I, I meet with our police chief. I know what's going on. And, and I know my colleagues speak to our police chief, and he's very forward, but there's a lot of things that can't be let out, but they are proactive. They're out there working hard every night. You don't see all the arrests in the paper. Some of them they have to keep quiet so they can get to the bigger dogs. But they are doing a heck of a job. And, and, a, and a true testimonial to that is the, uh, you know, the, de the forfeiture money, drug forfeiture money, which is coming into the city, which is helping fund some of the police projects. And, and some of the, we have two issues on, on the agenda tonight, 5B and 5C. When they come up, I'll be able to give a little bit more information on those uh, through my meetings with the, the police chief and all. But 
a big part of these being progressive and everything is, is the proactivity of our police department and, you know, the benefit of the drug forfeiture money because they are doing such a good job and, and keeping our city safe. But I don't want to see us go backwards. They've been doing a heck of a job without the COMD officers that they had just a few years ago, but it's overtaxing everyone, as one of our speakers mentioned before. I think we deserve more, not less. Uh, crime is a big thing, and blight is a big cause of crime. The broken window theory, you got a broken window, a house with broken windows on your house, it's going to bring in the crime element. So combined with the, the public safety and the blight issues and, and home rehab, I think that's a big factor we have to look at. That's a big factor that's going to bring our city back. What's going to sell the properties in our city is the public safety and the nicer neighborhoods. And then the people will be able to get their prices for their homes. Until we correct that, we're still staying stagnant. But uh, I'll, I'll discuss the 5B and 5C when we bring them up for a vote. But at this time, I believe that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Since Scranton... Oh, excuse me. I'm oh, sorry. This is a, absolutely. First thing I was going to tell Mr. Rogan, though, that, uh, you know, if Pete Bordy's was still open, it would only be 11 cents a beer rather than 10 cents with that tax. So. <laughs> <laughs> you're too, you're too uh, young to remember that. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, wow. sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Since Scranton's on-street parking program has been a subject of newspaper articles of late, I wish to provide a financial report for July 2013, the first month of management and operation by Republic Parking System. The report submitted by Republic is separated into three areas, income, expenses, and profit. First, Income is broken down into actual, budgeted, and variance. Actual revenue consists of all monies received, including meter money, bagging money, and citation revenue. Budgeted revenue is taken from historical data provided by the City of Scranton. It is not a projection. Rather, it's the actual revenue reported from the year 2012. Republic reports $83,894.12 in actual meter revenue for July 2013 and $66,426.94 for budgeted revenue, which represents July 2012 meter revenue. Also, actual citation revenue for July 2013 is $32,110, while budgeted citation revenue that represents July 2012 is 27400 The variance, then, between 2012 and 2013 shows a total increase of $22,177.18 in revenue. However, this figure does not include magistrate citation income. This information will be obtained from the Treasurer's Office and contained in subsequent Republic reports. Now, the second area, expenses, include payroll, what's called other expenses, which include uniforms, maintenance of meters, and operational costs, and capital expenses representing the actual cost of two vehicles, 750 new parking meters, and software purchased for use by the city. Capital expenses will be a fixed monthly cost for the term of the contract. July 2013 total expenses were $14,833.45 under what was projected. The projection was based on historical data from other cities and the particular needs of the city of Scranton. The final section 
where the third section is the net operating surplus, or NOS. This is the profit the city realizes after expenses are deducted. Per the management agreement, the Re Republic Parking receives all revenues, pays all expenses, and gives the city of Scranton a check for the difference or profit. In summary, the month of July 2013 was a success. Total revenues increased $22,177.18 over last year's number. Expenses were $14,833.45 under what was anticipated. And for the first time, the city, not the Scranton Parking Authority, is receiving revenue from bagged meters it owns. Also, today I received the August 2013 update, and Republic reports another very good month in revenues. Total revenues for the month of August were $130,000, an increase of $30,000 $488.74 over August 2012 and over July 2013 revenues as well. In addition, Republic reports it is on schedule to implement the remainder of the meter program. The license plate recognition or LPR vehicle should be fully operational by October 1st. While the 750 new credit card friendly meters are slated to arrive on September 23rd, that would be this coming Monday. Republic states that installation will require seven to 10 days to complete with very little disruption in service. Further, 27 meter poles were identified as missing in high revenue generating areas, and they were replaced in the last two weeks. These are all meter poles that are part of the city ordinance, but had vanished for various reasons. In addition, Republic is currently working toward bringing all handicapped meters up to ADA standards as soon as the new meters are installed. Republic's improvements should produce a positive impact on future meter revenues. I am very pleased not only by Republic Parking's management and operation of our city's parking meter program, but also by its demonstrated level of financial accountability and transparency, neither of which were provided by the previous operator, the Scranton Parking Authority. Next, when reviewing the ordinance which is applicable to the Historical and Architectural Review Board, or HARB, it seemed that in addition to Section 4B, Appointment Terms of Membership, additional sections of this ordinance were not followed in the case of HARB's recommendation to demolish the former YWCA building. Specifically, Section 5A, Advice to Governing Body of the City of Scranton, which states, quote, the Commission shall recommend to the governing body of the City of Scranton whether an application for a certificate of appropriateness should be approved, end quote. However, a certificate of appropriateness was already issued to the University of Scranton in May 2013, prior to the introduction of legislation by City Council in June 2013. In addition, Section 5B Use of criteria states, quote, the criteria to be used by the Commission in making its reports and recommendations to the governing body of the City of Scranton concerning their issuance of certificates of appropriateness shall include the effect of the proposed change on each of the following of six criteria which were not provided to City Council. Also, City Council has not received an annual report from HARB as required by ordinance. Although Council did receive some 2013 HARB meeting minutes, half of the information on each page was missing or obscured. 
Therefore, Mrs. Craik, I ask you to please provide a copy of this ordinance to all qualified HARB members so that each may reference our city code when facing future decisions to demolish, preserve, or restore historic city structures, and when developing and submitting bylaws to Scranton City Council for its approval. And finally, uh, the mayor informed me recently that street paving should begin at the end of this month, which is good news. And that's it. 5B, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to apply for and execute a grant application, and if successful, a grant agreement, and accept the funds related thereto through the BJAFY13 Edward Byrne Justice Assistance Grant JAG program local solicitation in the amount of $23,391. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Just on a question. Uh, as I stated earlier, I would explain uh, when I came up to vote on these here. I think Mrs. Uh, Schumacher had asked the question. This is uh, for the police department. Through this grant, they will be able to purchase two police cruisers, uh, two equipped police cruisers to enhance their, their police force. And this is a grant that they've received annually for the past few years. Yes. That, uh, they've been very successful at, uh, at writing for. So I, I think it's another asset for us and for public safety. Thank you. That's all. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Mrs. Evans, before we move along, mm -hmm. um, just notice that uh, we do need a temporary chair for finance. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that uh, Mr. Rogan be the temporary chair for finance. Second. Send the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it and so moved. Thank you, Councilman McGaugh. 5C, ratifying and approving the execution and submission of the grant application by the City of Scranton Police Department to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, DCED, for a local share account grant, gaming funds, Monroe County, in the amount of $146,467 for the City of Scranton Police Department for the acquisition and installation of the Community Surveillance Network System at Scranton Police Headquarters to enable the police to monitor cameras 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to accept the grant, if successful, and disperse the grant funds for the City of Scranton Police Department acquisition and installation of the Community Surveillance Network System. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, on the question. Uh, this program here, uh, the police department has applied for a grant uh, through the uh, local shares gaming funds, Monroe County. And what this would do, the Scranton Police Department will imp implement the community surveillance network through the funding provided by the local share account fund, Monroe County grant. Community surveillance network will consist of 32 monitor video while it will be located at the Scranton Police Department headquarters. The purpose of this project is to create a system in which all surveillance from cooperating agencies is connected in a closed circuit feed to the 32 monitors located at the Scranton Police Department. The police would then be able to monitor these cameras 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, I've heard questions about who would be monitoring. They do have people at the desk there who, you know, obviously work the desk and turn around and look at the existing camera. This is going to be a whole wall full of, full of cameras. And for those who are afraid of, are afraid of Big Brother watching, it, it's, it's not basically that. What this is, is, is businesses like banks that already have public cameras in their parking lots or outside. University of Scranton, uh, any of these commercial uh, businesses, and, and I guess it would even down the road entail if you, if you have one on your home and you wanted to tie in with this here, it's at no cost 
to the business or homeowner. Um, it's a great, it's a great program. Again, it's not going to inf infer on anybody's privacy because it's already existing cameras in public areas. What it what it will do will enhance the whole. Uh, actually, it's like putting more police on the street. Just say, for instance, on uh, North Main Avenue, uh, North Penn Bank was held up, and they made their getaway. Uh, suppose Catalano's or, or Keystone Lunch had cameras, or the Fidelity Bank down on Zern Street, all monitored, all tied into this system. Right off the bat, they get the call. They can see which way the vehicle goes, whether it's north or south, direct the police so that way and follow their cameras that they have in different locations. So this, this program integrates private surveillance with public surveillance into one system? Correct. So it makes, and it's easier for them, like rather than going and very reviewing nice. tapes, they have the system right there. That's uh, very nice. It, it's a live feed and it could be expanded. It's, you know, th this is set up so it could be expanded and again, uh, any updates or anything, the chief uh, had told me that a lot of that would be helped with the uh, drug forfeiture money. But, uh, you know, it, it does with today's technology and everything. Uh, I think it, it, it's definitely going to help us with crime in the city, too. This, this, but, sound, this sounds great. Mr. Lasky, does it record as well? I don't believe it records at the police station, but the individuals record. I'm not sure. I, okay. I could check on I, that. I remember a while back, um, it was actually a, a friend of mine, they had a car broken into in an area and they were checking to see if there were cameras. And I know a lot of businesses that have them on their own, um, especially the older systems, that I guess the tapes get taped. They only stay for so long. Right, yeah. If the city would have it also backed up, that could also help solve a lot of, a lot of small And I may be well. wrong on that. That's one question I didn't ask. So, you know, with the technology and that, I'm sure that they yeah, probably have something great. that would save it for a certain period of time. Yeah. But, you know, again, for those who are worried about Big Brother watching, well, it's here. Everybody has cell phones with videos. Everybody, you know, our, our privacy was gone a long time ago. But these are basically <laughs> existing or, you know, maybe new businesses that would add to this public uh, cameras that would help our police department uh, solve some crimes. And it's a, a great benefit. And that's all I have to say on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? All those in favor of introductions signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. And not to go on that, but there are some other things coming up that the, the police chief had advised me of that are going to be very good for the city. So. Uh, once they're presented to us, and I'll be able to elaborate on them a little bit more. But, but I'm I'm very proud that, of, of our police department and and the aggressiveness that they are. Again, you just have to look at our neighboring cities. But we have to keep providing them with the tools to keep us safe. And uh, and I think we've been also proactive at that because that's been one of our goals: the public safety here. And so I thank my colleagues on that too. Thank you. Sixth Order 6A, reading by title, Filed of Council Number 47, 2013, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the City of Scranton to take all necessary actions to implement the consolidated submission for community planning and development programs to be funded under the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG Program, Home Investment Partnership Home Program, and Emergency Solutions Grants, ESG Program, for the period beginning January 1st, 2014. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so move. I make a motion to table item 6A per the public 30-day comment period for the action plan. Second. On the question. All those in favor of tabling item 6A Signified by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Seventh order, 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Finance, file of council number 45, 2013, approving and accepting the updated City of Scranton capital budget for the year 2014, the first year revision and extension of the 2013 five-year plan. What is the recommendation 
of the acting chair for the committee on finance as acting chair for the committee on finance i recommend final passage of item 7a second on the question roll call please Mr. yes yes Mr. yes mrs evans yes i hereby declare item 7a legally and lawfully adopted 7B, for consideration by the Committee on Finance, file of Council number 46, 2013, creating and establishing a new account for the City of Scranton's Office of Economic and Community Development, OECD, titled PADCD Housing and Redevelopment Assistance Program, HRA, revolving loan funds account number 19A0101 for the receipt and disbursement of grant funds, DCD HRA grant funds received from the Scranton Connell LLC. What is the recommendation of the acting chair for the Committee on Finance? As acting chair for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of item 7B. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. 7C, for consideration by the Committee on Rules, Resolution Number 39, 2013, Appointment of Thelma Wheeler, 1001 Jackson Street, Apartment 303, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18504, as a member of the Board of the Scranton Housing Authority for an additional five-year term. Ms. Wheeler's current term expires on September 27, 2013, and her new term will expire on September 27, 2018. As chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7C. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7C legally and lawfully adopted. 7D, for consideration by the Committee on Rules, Resolution No. 40, 2013, Repealing Resolution No. 50, 2012, appointing John Moore, 315 13th Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18504, as a member of the Historical Architectural Review Board for an additional five-year term whose, term whose current term expired on October 11, 2012, and whose new term will expire on October 11, 2017. As chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 70. Second. On the question? Just on a question. Uh, since I wasn't here last week, I'm, I'm not quite up to date on this other than the, the memo and that. But uh, a, a yes vote would repeal the yes. resolution, mm -hmm. uh, nullifying that appointment, and a no vote would, would be to keep the appointment. Is that? Well, the, right. The no vote would be against repeal of the ordinance. And um, I had asked at last week's meeting that our solicitor would draft a letter to uh, the mayor uh, requesting that he ask for the resignation of Mr. Moore based on uh, the violation of the ordinance. And I believe our solicitor has done that. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Jack. No, that, that's all. I just thank you. Um, I, I, I've spoken to a number of uh, members of HARB, and um, from what they said, they were su as surprised as we were last week with the, as I was, I should say, with the legislation to, that would essentially remove Mr. Moore from um, the committee. Um, Mr. Moore is devoted quite a few years to HARB and um, I believe that what we're doing is a rather unceremonious way of, of removing a man who uh, has done a great deal of work um, for HARB and as chairman has done, I would say from what I'm told, the majority of the work for HARB. Um, I, I wish, I understand the legal aspects of it. Um, I wish that we had perhaps pursued some other avenues um, for, for dealing with this problem. Um, although I do understand that in the 
bylaws that they are that HARB is now adopting that they are including this these term limits in their own bylaws mm -hmm. um, so it, it would at some point in time affect all of the members of HARB but even at in 2017 Mr. Moore would have been forced to out of the um, committee or out of the board um, like I said, I, I just uh, I just feel that uh, in some way we're doing a disservice to Mr. Moore for all of the years that he has um, served as the chairman of of HARB. I would just make a brief comment. Um, when this and I want to thank Attorney Hughes. I know he's not here today. I did speak to him a little bit more about this issue today. Um, and just a comment, actually, on the, the newspaper article last week following. Um, the initial vote. Um, do I believe that this may be retaliation or this was brought up because of Mr. Moore's vote on Leahy Hall? Yes, I do. I agreed with Mr. Moore on the Leahy Hall vote. Um, but in this, when you're a, a council person or a legislator on any level, you're somebody who you agree with yesterday, you may disagree with today. And in this instance, I, I do believe, um, per Attorney Hughes's explanation, and speaking to hard members myself, that a yes vote is the proper thing to do here. Although I do appreciate uh, Mr. Moore's service and in his stance on, on, the, on the, the past is issue that was very controversial. Um, but I do believe after reading what was provided by our solicitor and speaking to hard members um, that a yes vote is, is the right vote here. I just wanted to add that um, this is not um, a matter of retribution in any way. As I mentioned, I think at last week's meeting, it was brought to my attention by city residents. I was not familiar with the ordinance. Obviously, the administration was not familiar with the ordinance. And so I asked uh, our solicitor to do the research. And when he came back to me with his findings, I asked our office staff to research all of the members, uh, the terms of all of the members of HARP, to be certain that it wasn't just one individual. Uh, you know, if there were more than one, all would be included. But the fact of the matter was, Mr. Moore was the only one in violation. Now, I'm sure that was not done intentionally by Mr. Moore, by the mayor, or by this council. It was done, I believe, unknowingly. But HARB is at a point now where it has admitted publicly it has operated with no bylaws. It very often does not even conduct monthly meetings. Uh, when it does, it appears that, you know, very, very seldom if ever members of the public are in attendance at those meetings. And as I mentioned earlier tonight, there are other provisions of that ordinance that have not been met by HARB in all the years, in all the 10 years that I've been seated on city council. And I think it's important for them now because they have, all of this has come to light through their facing the most important issue since the initiation of HARB that, you know, as, as a board, they haven't always, you know, despite the best intentions, haven't always um, operated appropriately, meaning, for example, they haven't had bylaws to refer to. They haven't presented annual reports to the governing body of the city of Scranton, et cetera. So I'd like to see them now start a clean slate. I do recognize that they're working on bylaws. And I hope they recognize, and I'm sure they will, when Mrs. Craig sends them a copy of that ordinance, which is a part of the city code. So it is a city law that the bylaws that 
they would approve and present to city council have to be approved by this council. Well, or another council perhaps, because I don't know that their bylaws are even going to be ready by the end of this year. Um, it very likely could happen in 2014 with the next council, but council nevertheless must approve that. And as I said, I think it is the best decision to start all of this process with a clean slate so that in the future, um, for every issue that arises, but most particularly for those very, very important issues that arise, such as, you know, what we currently, or what we recently faced, that board is well aware of its duties and responsibilities and that all of its members are indeed qualified to be seated on that board. If I just may add quickly, I, I, I don't want to elaborate, but I, 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 the first time I met Mr. Moore was that night we had our caucus here. I don't know him personally. Um, and, and again, as Mr. McGough did say, I, I do appreciate Mr. Moore's service to this uh, board over the years. I'm sure he spent many, many hours. It's a voluntary board and it takes a lot of dedication and I appreciate the dedication of anyone that takes those positions. But, um, you know, I mean, it's in black and white here and as Mr. Rogan said, that's something we have to follow. But uh, I do want to thank him for his service and, uh, you know, it's our, our vote is based on and what we have in front of us. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? A symbolic no. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Lasco? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7D legally and lawfully adopted. And if there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.